starting in verse 1, Luke chapter 22 and verse 1. But before we dive into the word, why don't we uh, briefly stand? And uh, let's focus our minds and our attention on the presence of the Lord in this place. Let's lift our hands. Let's lift our voices together in this house. God, I thank you, Lord, for this chance we have to come into your house. I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to draw close to you with believers, God, from across this city and across this region. I, I commit to you, God. I commit to myself that this will not be just another Sunday, Lord, but I am going to push into your presence. I'm going, God, to pursue you with everything that I have and everything that I am. I pray that every mind would be open. No distraction, no discouragement, Lord. Let every heart be ready to receive the word of God together. Uh, in Jesus' name, uh, amen. You may be seated. Luke chapter 22, and starting in verse 1. Luke chapter 22, starting in verse 1. It says, Now the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. And he went his way and communed with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him unto them. And they were glad and covenanted to give him money. And he promised and sought opportunity to betray him unto them in the absence of the multitude. Everybody say, the absence of the multitude. That's what I want to talk about here this next couple of moments in, in Sunday school class. We're talking about the absence of the multitude. It's a story in your Bible that many, if not all of us in this room, are quite familiar with. It's Judas Iscariot, hand-selected disciple of Jesus Christ. And he has spent as many as three and a half years daily following Jesus, he has seen God manifested in the flesh. He has seen and heard every story we read in the Bible. He has seen it with his own eyes. He's heard the parables and the teaching of Jesus. He has experienced firsthand the master teaching. He saw the face of Jesus Christ as he raised Lazarus. From the grave, he heard the shout, Lazarus, come forth. He was standing there. He got to look at Jesus as that miraculous resurrection happened after four days in the grave. He got to do something that you and I can only dream of or can only hope someday to see. I want to see the face of Jesus. But Judas got to see him every day. He had just witnessed the multitude shouting, Hosanna, and they're taking off their garments. They're laying them down in the street. They're tearing branches off of the trees, and they're putting them in front of this, this Jesus that Judas has followed. But evidently, something in the heart of Judas was not right. And many much smarter and much more educated than I have theorized and puzzled about it. But there was something left to remain inside the heart of Judas. Something that perhaps he should have recognized and dealt with long before this moment. But in the absence of the multitude, Judas now thought he had an opportunity. In John chapter 12 and verse 1, we, we read the accounting of Judas Six days before the Passover, Jesus comes to Bethany where Lazarus was. And it was in John chapter 11, just one chapter before, where Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Imagine, again, here's Judas eating and breaking bread with somebody that had been dead for four days. Then Mary took a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. But then says one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, he, he pipes up. Imagine having the audacity 
to judge and condemn somebody else's act of worship. He pipes up and says, why was this ointment not sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? And John, writing many years after this, puts in for you and I in verse 6, he, he didn't really care about the poor at all, but rather he was a thief. He had the bag and he bare what was put therein. And Jesus says to Judas, leave her alone. Against the day of my burying hath she kept this for. You're always going to have the poor with you, but you're not always going to have me. And in the Gospel of John, it's immediately after this anointing, or rather the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Mark, where we find Jesus, Judas leaving the presence of Jesus Christ and consulting with the Pharisees. There's something inside of him, whatever it was, this act of devotion, this act of worship from Mary was perhaps the final straw in the heart of Judas. It was, if you will, the pièce de résistance, whatever you want to call it. It was this place of resistance and rebellion against the teaching of his master. And Satan, ever the opportunist for evil, enters in to Judas. A small seed of resistance in the heart of Judas grows rapidly into a noxious and invasive weed. It, it begins to grow and expand because even those small things in our heart, if we don't deal with them quickly, can become something so pervasive and something that begins to fill every area and every corner of our heart. I submit to you today that Judas had some areas of his life that he never let Jesus deal with. We read in John chapter 13, now at the Last Supper, and Jesus is trying to enjoy his final meal with his closest disciples, and he is Troubled in spirit, and he testifies and says to them, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. It is telling that Judas had kept this so well hidden and so well buried inside that even to this point, the very night of the betrayal, nobody else knows what's going on. They began to look at one another. Is he, is he talking about Thomas? Is he, is he talking about me? In fact, another gospel records that they begin to ask and say, Lord, is it I? Is it, is it me? Is, am, am I the one that's going to betray you? And so there's, there's John laying on the breast of Jesus and Peter motions him and he, he, he tells him, ask Jesus. And so Jesus answers in verse 26. He said, he it is to whom I shall give the sop when I've dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. This is something that's lost on you and I, but this is an act of of honor. It's an act of importance. It is the best morsel of bread from the meal. It's the it's the very best that the meal has to offer. And even now Jesus is is referring to he's treating Judas with respect. He's treating him with love because even when there are those unsubmitted areas and and rebellious areas in our heart, our savior is still reaching for us. We find in the garden later when Judas comes up and he he comes to kiss Jesus, Jesus greets him as friend. But we read in verse 27, now after the sop, Satan entered in to him. Then said Jesus unto him, that thou doest, do quickly. Now, no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him. For some of them thought because Judas had the bag that Jesus said unto him, buy those things that we have need of against the feast, or that he should perhaps give something to, to the poor. It was Judas's favorite pretense, I'm going to minister to the poor. And he then, having received the sop, went immediately out, and it was night. And what a great darkness Judas walks into. Walking from the room filled with the light of the world, into all the darkness of hell. It is Satan's success story played out 
here in the Gospels, but repeated time and time again throughout the pages of human history. I do not come to you this morning to build up or to present him as any great success or as any any great threat to a spirit filled believer. But Satan does have successes time and time again throughout the pages of human history. His success was simply this separating one of the twelve from the twelve. Satan did not need all of them, though he would have gladly taken any of them. In fact, we read in, in Luke chapter 22 and verse 31, the Lord says to Simon, to Peter, he says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Jesus reveals perhaps to the surprise of Peter that Satan desired to have him. Never think for any moment that you're not on Satan's hit list. He would gladly take the lives of any one of us in this room. He would gladly receive you in this room. He would gladly receive the ability in that, that, that day, that moment to begin to sift through your life. And he had separated Judas from the herd. The Bible calls Lucifer a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. If you study out or you look at how lions hunt. They've got a very specific method of hunting, especially when they operate in packs. The lion does not go after the biggest, strongest, baddest looking wildebeest out there. And if they are going after that. Their desire is to cut it out or to separate it from the herd because it's far easier for the lion to take down one than to try to take down everybody. And so they look to find somebody that's sick, a sick animal. They they watch the herd. They look around for somebody that's got an illness inside of them or they look for a younger animal and the lions will begin to key in on the younger animal or they look for that elder animal that maybe doesn't have that same hitch and he's got a little hitch going on in his giddy up now that zebra can't quite gallop across the Serengeti like he used to and the lion locks in on those ones knowing hey there's somebody that I can focus in on. And in the absence of his brothers and in the absence of his master, Judas was far easier pickings. You see, who I am in the absence of the multitude is who I am. Now, I might work on me in the multitude and I should work on me in the multitude. And in fact, the multitude should begin to work on me because iron sharpeneth iron. But I will never truly know who I am. I will never truly know what is deep down inside my heart until the multitude disappears. Now, God is entirely willing to work on you in public. Read through the Gospels. There are some very public moments of rebuke. There are some very open moments where Jesus deals with something inside of someone's heart. In fact, I, it's not in my notes, but thinking of Acts chapter eight, where, where Peter says to the sorcerer who's asking to buy this gift of the Holy ghost from him, there's a very public moment where something inside of someone's heart is worked on. But some of the most tender Moments of scripture comes when Jesus works one on one. In John chapter three, Nicodemus separates himself from the multitude and he comes to Jesus by night. Yes, it, it might be because he's afraid of what everybody else will think. But I'll stand and say that that is in itself an act of hunger and an act of bravery. He wants to hear what Jesus has to say in a one on one setting. And Jesus, for the very first time in his ministry, lays out to somebody who sought him away from the multitude how to. To enter the kingdom of God. We're familiar with John chapter 3 and verse 3. In John chapter 3 and verse 5. It was somebody that sought him away from everybody else. That Jesus reveals a truth. You must be born of water and of spirit to enter the kingdom. In John chapter 4. 
Jesus meets with an undesirable or unpopular woman at a well all by themselves. And in that moment, Jesus reveals to her uh, in the absence of the multitude uh, that I who speak with thee am he. he. He reveals himself to the woman as the I am of the Old Testament. In Mark chapter 5, a solitary man with a multitude of demons inside of him runs to the feet of Jesus. The multitude had cast him out. They had pushed him out of their presence. They would said, you're not even welcome to be a part of the herd. But somebody, a one man, found uh, something at the feet of Jesus. In Mark chapter 8, Jesus leads a blind man by the hand away from the crowds. Could it be that there are moments of solitude in your life? There are moments where you are intended to be alone with the presence of Jesus Christ. Jesus could have simply spoken and his eyes would have been opened in that moment. But instead, knowing what this man needed and knowing what was inside of his heart, Jesus tenderly takes him by the hand and leads him outside the city before performing the miraculous In John chapter 5, Jesus heals an individual by the pool of Bethesda. He'd been infirm for 38 years, but this man, this man misses the moment. Because we read in John chapter 5 and verse 13, and he that was healed as he began to be questioned by the Pharisees, he, he wist not who it was. Imagine a 38 year life living as a crippled and in one moment you're healed and you don't even know who heals you. He didn't know who it was because Jesus had conveyed himself away a multitude being in that place. The man was not comfortable to follow Jesus away from the multitude. And I wonder today how many of us are afraid to follow Jesus into a place of solitude, into a place where it's just me and him because we're afraid uh, to be alone. We're afraid to be with our own thoughts. We're afraid to be with our own feelings. We're afraid to be alone with our own temptations. We're afraid to go to a place where we have to confront the inner man. We have to look at what's going on inside of us. We're afraid to be alone With our temptations. What you do in the absence of the multitude will determine who you are. Now, I submit to you that you are never truly alone because the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the earth. And he is looking for those who will remain faithful. He's looking for those who will honor him, who will follow him. The Gospels record that Nathanael's mind was blown because Jesus saw him under the fig tree. Long before Nathanael even knew, uh, Jesus saw him. The absence of the multitude, a distance from fellowship, were intended for private moments with the Lord. We must be comfortable enough with solitude to allow Jesus to minister to our lives. See, our our example, Jesus in Mark chapter one, and I believe it's verse 26. The Bible records that Jesus, a great while before day, would get up in the morning and depart out into a solitary place to pray. There is a time and a place in our lives where we've got to be comfortable stepping away from the multitude and stepping away from those places and getting into the presence of Jesus Christ. We must turn our hearts over to the Lord. It's when we're alone that we can allow him to do the surgery that he wants to do. It's it's when we're alone that he can begin to reveal to us things about ourselves and things uh, inside of our heart that he He wants to work on. And so if you find yourself alone uh, and you find yourself momentarily separated from the rest of the herd, uh, it is not as Judas thought it was an opportunity to do wrong. uh, But when you find yourself alone, uh, begin to speak his name, uh, begin to ask him to work on you, begin to ask him to perform uh, that spiritual surgery on you. I can think of moments in my teenage years where I was afraid to be alone. Not afraid of the dark. 
Not, a, not afraid of just being alone. I, I enjoy being alone. Now, you, you maybe don't believe that because you know that I'm extroverted. But I, I enjoy, thoroughly enjoy a 24-hour period where it's just me. That's an incredible feeling. But what I do when it's just me will determine who I really am. Now, Judas had something, and perhaps it's the reason why so many of us fear solitude. Unrepented sin in his life. An open door to the enemy. Unsurrendered corners of his heart. Now, unsurrendered, of course, is just a slightly less harsh term for rebellious. Guilt and shame condemnation, these are tools of the enemy. Because as a roaring lion, he is working to separate you from safety. And if he, working through guilt and shame, can cause you to withdraw yourself from the multitude by that that crippling fear, he will plant inside of you thoughts uh, and and, and thinking that you'll begin to think, well, nobody's going to notice if I'm gone. Nobody's even going to care if I'm not there. Nobody's even going to notice if I'm, if I, I, I've messed up too many times before. I'm just going to withdraw over here. You see, that's a dangerous place for us to get. It's a, a time where I'm not properly withdrawing from the multitude. Now I've withdrawn to an area of danger and the lions are closing in. He uses offense between brothers and sisters in the church. He uses division within the church to begin to cut out and to separate people. And they'll begin to separate themselves from the flock because, well, bless God, you don't know what so-and-so said to me. You don't, you don't know what they did to me. I, I don't like how pastor dealt with this. I don't like how pastor dealt with that. And so somehow as an attempt to get back at the body and to show everybody, well, I'll show you, you separate yourself from the safety of the herd. It's deception. It's, it's the leading of the enemy. It's a deception when we think uh, that there's an opportunity for us to step into the absence of the multitude and somehow we're going to do better on our own. It's why Paul writes in Ephesians chapter four and verse 27, neither give place to the devil. In James chapter 4 and verse 6, James writes that he giveth the more grace. Wherefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh unto you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. The context of both of these portions of scripture, either immediately preceding or immediately after, is there is a division inside of the church that the writer is teaching them on how to get through. You see, it's a tool. It's, it's for instruction. It's for unity and the preservation of unity within the church. Because though there may be moments where we withdraw into the presence of God in that solitude, you were created to be in relationship. You were created to be in relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And you were most certainly created to be in relationship with the rest of the body of Christ. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18, the Lord lays out a truth that is remaining true even to this day. It is not good that man should be alone. In Luke chapter 15 and verse 4, Jesus teaches this parable. What man of you having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doesn't leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he finds it? There's a reason the shepherd goes after one. It's that the one is in danger. When alone and separated from the rest of the herd and not in the presence of the shepherd, the one is in grave danger. And it was not the will of the shepherd. It, it, it is not God's will nor God's intention for you to be separated from the flock. It is his desire to go find the one and reunite them with the ninety and nine. 
Jesus sent out his disciples. He sent them out as sheep into the midst of wolves. But even then, the Lord did not send them out by themselves. He sent them out two by two. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse 9, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow, but woe unto him that is alone when he falleth. What would have happened if Judas had had a brother? We can only speculate. We can only wonder, but what if Judas had had a deep relationship with somebody else? What if, what if there had been somebody who could look into the heart of Judas? Yes, Jesus was there. Again, we're only speculating, but what if there was somebody else that held him accountable? And, and back in, in John chapter 12, when Judas is freaking out about Mary pouring out worship on Jesus, Thomas maybe pulls him aside and says, Yo, Judas, I, I've been watching you, and there's something that's not right inside of you. Woe unto him that is alone when he falleth. He does not have another to help him up. And if verse 11, if two lie together, they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. If you've been having a hard time maintaining that passion that zeal, that fire inside of you. You need to find a brother. You need to find a sister. You need to find somebody in this church. Pastor Mark says it all the time. If, if you only see the faces in this church on a Sunday morning, you're doing something wrong. You're missing the point of the body. You're missing the point of the flock entirely. But if we find somebody that we can hold accountable and somebody that can look into my life, somebody that can begin to look at me and, and help me to see myself, Mm, you've got somebody to push you. You ever consider this? We are to crucify ourselves daily. Can you drive three nails in by yourself? I mean, I could nail down perhaps this arm. I could nail down these feet. But now I've got a problem. Perhaps, just maybe... You need help crucifying flesh and you need the help of the body to come along beside you and say, you know what? Your attitude's a little bit off. Your, 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 your motives a little bit off. But when the body comes around and begins to minister to the body, uh, then uh, we begin to have heat. Then we begin to have strength. Watch this in Leviticus chapter two and verse eight. He says, five of you will chase an hundred and an hundred of you will put 10,000 to flight and your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. There is a multiplicative effect of getting together with other believers that we could use the word. We could call it synergy. I might have great strength because I've spent time away from the multitude with the Lord. But when I unite with a brother that has also spent time away from the multitude with the Lord, uh, and now we join arm in arm uh, and the church comes together, uh, we are far stronger when all of the parts are in a whole. Uh, You might be great and big and strong and mighty, but cut off from the body. It's just a matter of time until you are dead uh, and worthless and for Satan just to eat and devour as he will. Uh, But when you bring your strength uh, and you put it back in the body uh, and you connect with everybody else, uh, now there's something incredible that God can do. It's unavoidable in our lives that there are periods of solitude. But what we do with those periods is important. Your solitude cannot and must not become isolation. One final story as I close here from the book of First Kings. Elijah, I mean, he rocks it on Mount Carmel. If there is ever, without the indwelling power of the Holy Ghost, I mean, he's got the Holy Ghost all over him. Swagger is the only term that I could think of. I mean, he's sitting there watching the prophets of Baal cut themselves and shout. He's like, you go first. It's dry, man. He's letting them have the heat of the day. There might be an accidental fire. And he's just sitting there and he's like, maybe he's asleep. Maybe, maybe he's on a long journey. 
And then it comes his time. I, you could just see it on him. It's his turn for a sacrifice. And he gets the stones. He lays the wood. He puts the bullock on. He said, bring me some water. And they pour water over it. And again. And then a third time. And now this precious resource of water is all over the place. And then Elijah just pray. I'm telling you, man, he's in the presence of the multitude. Uh, and he's feeling it. There's an anointing upon him. It's so powerful. And he's just got this swagger in the Holy Ghost. And fire falls from heaven. And he commands the people. They grab up 850 and they slaughter them. And he tells the king, go to your palace. It's going to rain. He calls now. Not just fire from heaven, but water down from heaven as well. But when there's no multitude. One chapter later in 1 Kings chapter 19, he flees to Beersheba. Even beyond that, he he gets out of the presence of the multitude. And now he wants to be alone so desperately that he leaves his servant behind. Not even the multitude. Now he's got no brother with him. And he staggers out and says, I'm just going to lay down under this juniper tree and I'm going to die. And God wakes him, feeds him. He has a nap and a meal. Those are two powerful things. Sometimes you're not depressed. You're just hungry and tired. Go get a nap and get a meal. Go get some rest. See what that does for you. I am a a proponent of just sleeping on things sometimes. Man, if I got to, I've taken it to the Lord in prayer. I'm going to go to bed. And tomorrow morning, it's probably not going to be that big of a deal. And God serves him a meal. He goes 40 days into the wilderness. We withdraws into the cave. He's so seeking of isolation. He's he's been completely separated from the herd. But the shepherd goes after the one. And God finally speaks to him in a still small voice and says, what are you doing here? And I speak to somebody in this room right now and ask you, what are you? Are you doing? There are valuable moments to learn to be alone with the Lord. But what are you doing? Don't separate yourself from the multitude. Don't don't separate yourself from the church. Don't withdraw from your brothers and sisters. What are you doing? And God tells him, go anoint Hazael. Go anoint Jehu. Go anoint Elisha. He's going to minister to you. At the end of it all, God says to him, look, uh, you're going to have somebody who's going to minister to you. I'm going to give you somebody that's going to give you strength. Uh, I'm going to connect you to somebody that's going to give you encouragement. I'm going to connect you to somebody that's going to give you peace and he's going to give you rest and he's going to give you help. The Bible records that. Though it's the third thing he's told to do, it's the first thing Elijah does. He goes and finds Elisha. The others come later in his ministry. But in wisdom, Elijah realizes, you know what? I can't be alone. Uh, I'm going to go find Elisha. I'm going to have, I got to have his presence. I got to have somebody with me. I got to have some help here. And on his way off the mountain, God speaks and says, oh yeah. I've still got the multitude. There's there's seven thousand Elijah, you you might feel distant and separate from them, but I've still got a multitude over here. It's it's up to you to reconnect to them. It's up to you to find your way back. Let's all stand together in this place this morning. You see, the absence of the multitude can begin to reveal inside of us things that perhaps are not right. And what I do with what's revealed inside of me is very telling of my spiritual condition. Judas saw a moment away from the multitude that looked like an opportunity to sin. But sin is never an opportunity. Sin might be an occasion, but it's never an opportunity. But instead, in those moments where I I find myself withdrawing, I must withdraw into the presence of God Almighty and allow Him to work on my life. And I've got to remember this simple truth. I am created to be a part of the multitude. I'm created to be a part of the body. Let's lift our hands in this place as we close. God, 
I pray today that this word would sink down into our lives and our hearts. I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice that is afraid to be alone. I pray, God, that that fear would be cast out right now and I replace it with peace, Lord. I pray that they would find a place and a time to seek out your presence where it's just you and it's just them and your spirit can begin to work on our hearts. God, uh, I don't ever want to view it as an opportunity for sin, uh, but I always want to view it as that opportunity, Lord, to draw close. Uh, I pray for everyone that feels alone, Lord. Uh, connect them to a brother. Connect them to a sister that is going to minister to them, uh, that is going to pour into them. And Lord, uh, let there be no division. Uh, let there be no disunity. Let there be no offense in the body, God. Uh, for we are stronger together. Uh, we are far stronger, Lord, uh, when every piece is supplying what it should supply. Uh, I pray it in Jesus' name, help us, God, uh, in the absence of the multitude.